Um, the eardrum, the tympanic membrane. We've looked at lots of anatomy of the ear, um, but what I'm thinking of, I'm thinking that health professionals, medical students, look at the tympanic membrane, and there are a number of structures that you should be able to recognise. Um, we're going to look at that sort of level of detail, and chuck in a few other bits and bobs. We'll also talk about, you know, perforated eardrum, that sort of thing, um, and how the tympanic membrane works and what it does, all the usual stuff. But we're going to look at the tympanic membrane's anatomy in a little bit more detail, all right? First of all then, um, so we've got a right ear. Uh, here's the external ear. Uh, this is the external auditory meatus, so external ear. There's the tympanic membrane. Now, this is the eustachian tube leading to the nasopharynx, the nasal cavity. Um, so here, this is the middle ear, external ear, middle ear, and then inside the bone here, we find the cochlea, we find the semicircular canals and the other vestibular apparatus. That's the inner ear. So the tympanic membrane is the boundary, the separation between the external ear and the middle ear. The job of the tympanic membrane, well, you might consider it to have two jobs really if you think hard about this, but the, the primary job of the tympanic membrane is that it is a stretched membrane, it's under a little bit of tension, and it is incredibly sensitive, it's very thin, and it's a bit stretchy, and it's able to respond to vibrations in the air. And those vibrations then get transmitted through, I'll take this apart in a minute, through the tiny bones inside the ear, the ossicles. And the purpose of the ossicles then is to take those vibrations, those forces from the tympanic membrane and translate them to the oval window on the cochlea. And then those vibrations will be transferred to the fluid inside the cochlea and make hair cells vibrate and trigger neurons. And then our brain perceives sound and we can make sense of that. So this is incredibly sensitive apparatus, which is really important. My ENT colleagues, my ear, nose and throat surgeon buddies, tell me uh, you should never stick anything in your ear. Well, they say never, nothing bigger than your elbow anyway, which I think pretty much counts everything out, right? Don't stick anything in your ear because this is so sensitive. The tympanic membrane is so sensitive. By the way, the tympanic membrane is the eardrum. Um, it is so delicate and so sensitive. It can be burst by Loud, really, really loud sounds, but we'll talk more about that in a mo. All right, so I'm going to have to tease this apart to get out the tympanic membrane. But before I do that, note the jaunty angle that the tympanic membrane is lying at. It's not square on to this tube here. It's at an angle. Um, if you are looking at the tympanic membrane with an otoscope, um, this tube has also got a bit of a wonk to it. It's different in children and adults. You might have to pull on the external ear to get the right angle to look at the whole thing. But also note the angle that you're actually observing the tympanic membrane at, right? Uh, remember, I have a PhD. I am an anatomist. Um, I don't look in people's ears because I don't really want to look in people's ears. So it's not something I do, but... If I tease this out, we can see that there's the tympanic membrane there, and it's also, it's, it's domed, right? So on the deep surface of the tympanic membrane, we have the small bones, the small ossicles of the ear that, tra that are transmitting force from the tympanic membrane to the cochlea. So the, the superficial surface, the surface closest to the outside world that we're looking at there, it's concave. And it's held concave because the malleus bone is, is pulling on it and is pulling it into that tensed position. Now, <laughs> embryologists will know there is some very, very cool, fun embryology here. We've got the pharyngeal arches of the head. We've got two pharyngeal arches meeting here, leaving a gap in between is a pharyngeal cleft and a pharyngeal uh, pouch. And the tympanic membrane then is also separating the outside world from the inside world. Um, honestly, the those who know, know the embryology is great fun. But that also means um, that 
In terms of nerves that innervate this area, the facial nerve gets involved, the trigeminal nerve gets involved, the vagus nerve gets involved, the glossopharyngeal nerve gets involved. Those are all nerves of the pharyngeal arches that are going to form structures of the, of the face and the neck, the head and the neck. But, um, so the innovation here is a bit weird, um, but I don't think people worry too much about that clinically. But this then is another function of the tympanic membrane. Um, I talked in, I don't know, the last handful of weeks, I talked about the anatomy of the skin, which covers the outside of the body. And I talked about the anatomy of mucosa, which lines the external surfaces inside the body and how they're continuous and how important it is to keep things outside the body, pathogens and what have you. The tympan tympanic membrane, look, it's doing the same thing. So it is protecting the middle ear. It's keeping the middle ear separate from the outside. So in terms of infection, the tympanic membrane is important, but we will also see that the, the middle ear is connected to the nasal cavity. So it's connected to the outside world in that way. But the tympanic membrane then has a function in hearing, but it also has a function in, in protection. Right, so if we look at the tympanic membrane, we can see that it is concave, it is pulled inwards. And if we look, so we're looking now at the, the lateral surface, the external surface, the superficial surface of the tympanic membrane, this is covered in skin. The tympan, the neck, so there are three layers of the tympanic membrane. The outer surface is covered in skin. The inner, the deep surface is covered by mucosa. They're both very, very thin layers, and in between those two layers, there is a connected tissue, but it's, uh, it's kind of an elastic connective tissue. It's not your standard fascia, which is mostly type 1 collagen. There's a lot of type 2 and type 3 collagen in here, so it's a little bit stretchy is what I'm trying to say. It's got some tension in it. And uh, what we can see is right in the middle, that long line because also the tympanic membrane is a little bit transparent. And if you're looking at the tympanic membrane with an otoscope, you're also shining a light in here. The big feature in the middle is the, the malleus bone, the hammer, the first of the ossicles. And we're looking at the handle of the malleus or the manubrium of the malleus. And the deepest part of that concave bit, the deepest part, the deepest part of the dip is the umbo. And that's the point, that's like the, the tip of the handle, the tip of the, uh, the malleus bone is pulling the tympanic membrane to its deepest point at that point. So that's the umbo, and that's the manubrium of the malleus. Now, most of the tympanic membrane, it's a little bit stretched, it's under a little bit of tension. So it gets called the pars tensor, as in that is the part that's tense, the pars tensor. Now, the superior bit up here, the bit that's superior to the malleus, gets called the pars flaccida because it's not under so much tension. Uh, that also gets called shrapnel's membrane. The ring around the outside is called the annulus. This ring is uh, um, a fibrocartonaginous ring that is supporting the tympanic membrane, and that's where it meets the bone, right? So the annulus, the pars tensor, the pars flaccida, the manubrium of the malleus, and the umbo. And then, because you're shining a light in here, so the observer is shining a light with the otoscope onto the tympanic membrane. And because the tympanic membrane is a bit reflective, um, something gets called the, the cone of light. And the way in which this is angled in the ear canal and the way in which the light is going in, the way you're looking at it, the cone of light is the light that's reflected back to you, and it tends to be, it's, it's found on the, remember this is a, a right ear, so it, it's found on the inferior portion of the tympanic membrane. That's all the cone of light is, it's just that light being reflected back at you because of the angle at that point. And if you look at a lot of tympanic membranes, unlike me, um, you'll get to, You'll get used to seeing what normal tympanic membranes look like. So when you see a ruptured tympanic membrane, it should be pretty obvious, right? But um, the pars flaccida is, is not so easy to see. It's not so easy to, to look at. You have to take a bit of care. Now, it's not really present on this model. This isn't quite the right shape. But the pars flaccida 
has an anterior membrane and a posterior membrane. It's kind of, uh, well, that is exactly where the pars flaccida becomes the pars tensor. And those are also known as the malleolar folds. Remember, we're dealing with the malleus bone here. Now, um, a, a cholesteatoma is um, essentially, it's a, a keratinous growth. It's a keratinization of structures in the, the middle ear. And my ENT colleague tells me again that you, you're probably gonna have to manipulate the ear to look properly at the tympanic membrane. But the importance of the pars flaccida is that's where you're most likely to first see signs of a cholesteatoma um, through that part there. That's why it's important. So that's the anatomy of the tympanic membrane. Now, what about, what about, can I get this back in again? Um, what about a perforated eardrum then, or a ruptured tympanic membrane? Well, um, because the tympanic membrane is thin, it's sensitive, and it's, it's sensitive to pressures, as I said, um, powerful pressure waves or big differences in pressure between the external ear and the middle ear can damage the tympanic membrane. So very, very loud noises, explosions that generate high air pressures. Um, scuba divers or divers generally, you know, um, apnea divers can also uh, damage their eardrums because the water out here is at a high pressure, the air in here is at a low pressure, the tympanic membrane just gets stretched, gets pushed by that pressure until it eventually fails and ruptures. So of course the way to deal with that is you can, you can equalize the pressure by you, uh, you block off your nose and you don't, you don't blow hard. You just kind of push a little bit of, you e increase the pressure in here by just pushing a little bit of pressure on that side. So you equalize the pressure in your ears when you're diving um, to protect the tympanic membrane. But the tympanic membrane is very sensitive. So anybody that has dove, dive, anybody that's gone deep under the water, you probably will have felt that sensation in your ear. It's painful. It's a warning and you equalize the pressure and if you get it right, the pain goes away. It can be a little bit difficult to equalize the pressure by the way sometimes. Anyway, that's a story for another day. If the eardrum ruptures, it may well be painful. There may well be bleeding from the ear and there may well be a certain loss of hearing, not a complete loss of hearing, but a loss of hearing to some extent. And the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, will actually repair that hole itself over a number of weeks in most cases. But now, of course, you've got uh, an opening. You've lost the protection of the tympanic membrane. So you have a link between the external ear and the middle ear. So when the eardrum, when the tympanic membrane is repairing that perforation, um, the person needs to be extra careful. Don't let water get in the ear. Um, to reduce the risk of infection getting to the middle ear, because infection in the middle ear, well, it's a lovely place for bacteria. They really like it in there. Speaking of which, um, otitis media. Oh, by the way, if you've got um, a hole that isn't repairing in the tympanic membrane, surgically, sometimes a, a membrane can be uh, patched onto the hole, and the membrane really is encouraging the cells to repair uh, over that hole and re re repair and rebuild the tympanic membrane. Otitis media refers to an infection in the middle ear. So I said the middle ear is connected to the nasopharynx and the nasal cavity by the eustachian tube or the pharyngotympanic tube. Pharyngotympanic tube. Um, so an upper respiratory tract infection can work its way up here and get nice and comfy in the middle ear. Um, so an infection in the middle ear, um, bacteria uh, are collecting in there and you might get a buildup of pus. So you've got an increase in pressure in the middle ear. So the increase in pressure on the tympanic membrane, this very, very sensitive membrane, is stretching it kind of in the other way. So that pressure can be painful um, and with repeated ear infections, maybe you might want to surgically put a hole in the tympanic membrane, a tympanostomy, a hole, right, uh, to relieve that pressure. So to allow the pus to drain out, I'm sure many of you have had earache. It's not very nice. Um, yeah, so otitis media as a result of infection in, in the middle ear. Pretty common in kids for a number of reasons. Anyway, 
That is the anatomy of the tympanic membrane. Link it up to all the other anatomy of the ear. And we've just looked at the tympanic membrane in a little bit more detail, uh, considering those features that you would see with an otoscope when examining um, the tympanic membrane in somebody's ear. Okay, right. See you next week.